So, hi everybody. I'm extremely excited to be here in JS Congress. And welcome to my session about event sourcing in Node.js. So first, I would like to introduce myself a little bit. So I'm enthusiastic about writing code. It's the best thing in the world. I manage large development teams, and I'm also a software architect. So I'm going to start very soon to work at Palo Alto Networks as an architect of a development group who is developing in Node.js. So as Courtney said, I founded my own startup that was a social network for food lovers. And at that point, I got really deep into Node.js because my entire backend was written into Node.js. And that is the point in the time that I got like the real passion in that technology. And you can find me on Twitter, and here's my Twitter handle. So other stuff that I would like to say about myself. So I'm in maternity leave. Actually, I gave birth about two and a half months ago. And that is, uh, you see a picture of my um, youngest child over here. Yeah. Um, I have three kids, and my older daughter, my oldest daughter is three years old, and I'm also a professional violin player in addition to being a developer. So, after talking about myself, let's get to business. Let's write Twitter. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about how we're going to model the server entities on a Twitter-like application, and only 10 seconds because I only have 25 minutes. So uh, 8, 7, 6, 5, all right. So um, let's talk about it. I would probably need a user model uh, with a username, first name, last name, I would probably need a tweet model with a tweet ID, a text, the user ID who tweeted. And you know, let's talk a little bit about relational DBs. I would probably need some kind of a connection between a user and the user it, he follows. So I might have one column of user ID and one column of follow ID, and there would be some kind of a similar structure for likes. So let's think about with that structure, how we are going to build our news feed. So we are probably need to uh, fetch from the tweet model. Um, um, we will fetch all the tweets um, that all the users that I follow have tweeted. So I would probably need to join the tweets table on the um, user table, because if you can see in the tweets table, I don't have any of the display data. I really need to display the first name and the last name on the screen. And I would probably need to join the tweet with the following the table, because I need to know which users I follow. And I would probably need to join with the likes. And I might be ending with something like this. And my question to you is how this is going to scale. Let me give you the answer. Not really well. So I have to say that the code that you've just seen was a code that I write, once wrote in Twitter production. Just kidding, I never worked on Twitter. But um, really, once in the early days of Twitter, this is how they model their database and their entities. And they got a lot of reactions from users like this really angry guy who is bumping his keyboard on the screen because the news feed was not scalable. It was not really uploaded um, really fast. So a lot of users were frustrated. So why this is happening? In the traditional software architecture, the traditional software model, you have a client, you have a server, and all of your entities are saved in the database. And you have one schema, and that one schema um, served you for reads and for writes. And when you wanted to update an entity, you would do it in place in your database, because your database is holding the, um, you know, the state of the entity. Um, so in that case, when the entity is in the database, 
uh, let's say that I have 10 uh, screens on my application or on my website, then this one model that I have has to be optimized for all the queries that I'm generating. And now I want to ask you another question, because I really, really love my relational DB. I'm really used to it. And when I'm saying optimizing a query in my relational DB, it ends up with adding an index, right? So my question to you is, can I add one more index? So here is a small table that I have here of username, first name, last name. So I'm going to I'm going to add one index on the last name. This is cool. I'm going to add another index on the first name. This is also cool. I'm going to add another combined index on the first name and the last name. And you know, then I can add fourth index on other two columns, and then another fifth index on everything. And what I want to say that eventually is gonna, this is going to break, because when you have too many indexes, everything that your database is doing is updating indexes. You're not really optimizing in that case. So optimizing for everything, optimizing one model to fit to everything would never work. Now, I would like to introduce you to another extremely frustrated person. Let's meet our system administrator. So why he's, why he's so frustrated? Because he's stuck with a schema that he once selected. Every migration is a pain in the ass. If he wants to, um, you know, to add a field, then he has like a huge migration process and he has headaches from that. And, uh, you know, the system is not recoverable because all the changes are made in place. And, you know, he doesn't have any history. If you want to recover the state of the system, if something is screwed, he doesn't have a good way to do that. And in order to solve all of those problems, here comes a new architecture pattern called event sourcing. So what is event sourcing? Event sourcing is modeling all, every activity that you are doing in your system as an activity in a huge immutable log. Let's take, for example, changing the last name of the user. I am going to save to a huge immutable log one record with, let's say, action would be update user, um, field would be last name, and new value would be the value that I'm updating. So I have a huge log, and all of the events in that log are immutable. I cannot change them, and I have consumers working on that log. Every consumer is preparing the data for its specific query that it needs to serve. For example, I would have one consumer, if we're on Twitter mind, I would have one consumer to build the newsfeed. I would have one consumer to build uh, the list of the users that I follow. So event sourcing is actually about separating between the right side and the read side of the application. And that is um, a subset of a bigger architecture pattern called CQRS. You are welcome to look that. CQRS is all about separating right side from read side. So after I've spoke, I would like to show you a small demo that I have created in advance. So um, let's look at that. That is a really lightweight Twitter application that I have built. So I'm following these three users right now. And that's my news feed. Everybody here is tweeting. So I would like to search for this nice guy who is actually a friend of mine. And I want to follow him right now. So let's go into the list of the users that I am following. So I would refresh. And here is um, Uri that right now I'm following him in that list. And let's look at the news feed. And um, his tweet is here. He's now visiting Japan as in he's having a really good time. But right now, what I want us to go is to go to Postman. 
Postman is a tool for sending HTTP requests for whoever doesn't know it. I hope you know it. But I just um, I organized in advance here a query for my event log. So just look at the object. I have here one object. And it's, he's re that is a representation of a post with um, object. And uh, that is the action that I'm working on. That is the user who has done this post with. And the text is, my dry run is awesome. So that's how all the activities in my system looks like. So um, let's go a little bit into the code of this server. So this is a Node.js server. I would like to start with um, this. This is my event schema. This is written in Mongoose out of convenience. I know we've been talking a little bit about relational databases in the beginning. So in the event schema, I have currently five fields. The field action is representing um, the optional actions that I can have here. And they can be post with, follow user, or like tweet. And the user ID is the user who performed the action. And let's say the text field. The text field here is used for tweeting action. So in tweet action, I, that field is going to be filled with the text of the tweet itself. And that is the field who's representing the user that I start to follow. So that is how my events are modeled, and every activity in the system is written to here. So let's um, talk a little bit about other models that we have in the system. Is this just a user model? Uh, really, really nothing special about it. But I want to show you the newsfeed model. The newsfeed model is fetching a newsfeed by user ID. All right? So I'm just going to fetch the newsfeed for a specific user. And I'm going to get an array of tweets with it. And every tweet is going to have um, the text of the tweet, the username, the first name, the last name, everything that I need to display without fetching stuff from different places. And um, that model is representing the list of the users that I follow. Again, by user ID, I'm going to get that list. And every object in this array will contain um, all the details that needs to be displayed on the screen. So let's um, look a little bit about, uh, let's look a little bit on um, how this is built. I want to go to that file. That file is um, representing building um, the list of the users that I follow. Uh, let's look at that function. That function is a timer running every 10 seconds and executing this function. Um, that's the name, build user follows. What that function is doing, first of all, I'm getting all the appropriate events. I'm running a query on my event log. And the action that I'm running is the action that I'm searching for is follow user. All right, so after I have all the events that I need, the next thing that I'm doing is fetching all the users from the user table. And after doing all of that, I'm creating an instance in the model representing that list. Um, it's a get or create because, you know, in the first time that that timer is running, so there is no instance um, in the database. So I need to create it. But if you know, that instance exists, I just fetch it. All right, so and when that instance exists, I set the user follows and I save it. And what I want to tell you that newsfeed here is built in a really similar way. Here, I also have a timer. And um, that timer also run um, within 10 seconds and executing that function. And that function is uh, doing a um, bunch of actions. I have here a hard-coded user ID just for the demo. But I'm getting all the users that he follows. Well, I am um, getting all the, here is the query on my event log. I'm getting all the events with an 
activity with an action of post tweet, and, and all the tweets that are related to the users that I follow. And after doing that, I'm, all, again, creating an instance and then building a tweet object which would contain everything that I need for presentation. So this is how um, we are building um, our, um, our news feed. So uh, guys, after we've spoke a little bit about the code, let's talk about the advantages of that method. So what are the advantages? So each view, first of all, can have its own storage. I mean, you can throw everything to an elastic search if you want like, to have um, a very efficient search index, for example. That could be a consumer, too. But each view has the most optimized storage to fetch the data. So that is the first thing. The next thing, it's really, really, it's much easier to scale in that method. So you can scale up to millions of concurrent users. I would like to say, too, that I spoke about an example coming from an internet company. But this architecture pattern is going into enterprise companies because enterprise companies also need to, you know, to hold those kind of scale. I would give you an example. In Palo Alto Networks, um, we develop an antivirus, and you have an agent on every computer, and that agent is approaching the same server on cloud. So we are getting millions of computers, so we are getting those scales. So with that pattern, it's much easier to scale. And I want to say that schema migration is much, much simpler because, um, well, everything that I need to preserve is my event log itself. I don't need to preserve anything else. All of my views can be recreated. So migration becomes much, much simpler, and system recovery is also easier because my recovery is depending just with my immutable log, and that's it. So um, now let's talk a little bit about patterns and event sourcing. So what I've showed you is the first pattern called event log, where you have a huge log stored in a storage, and you have consumers running, let's say, a select query in that storage. But I assume that that can sound a bit crazy to you, because I have a huge log. I have consumer running select query. But modern databases, I mean, MySQL would not do it great. Postgres would not do it great. I think that MongoDB would not do it great. but Modern databases like, for example, Event Store would do it really well. Hadoop, that's a framework by Apache for that, that framework enables us to process jobs and to scale from one machine to 1,000. We do it well, and they have a really nice uh, Node.js NPM library called WebHDFS. Check it out. That would do it good. Couchbase, with their event uh, log service, would do it great. And also, they have a great NPM library called NPM Couchbase. Check it out. And I want you to you know, check out the library called Event Store. Event Store would help you implement event log pattern. It's an NPM nice library, um, which um, have a great implementation, and it can help you integrate with multiple databases and multiple consumers. And if you, you haven't heard about Nest, check it out. But Nest has a built-in CQRS module that can help you implement that, too. So another optimization that I would like to talk about is the consumers working in batch. That means that um, since I have a huge amount of data, each consumer would save the endpoint where it stopped and just process the next chunk. So that is also a good optimization, and you can achieve um, good scales with that optimization, even with using, for example, MongoDB or stuff like that. So let's recap what we had so far. We have started with uh, changing the state of the applications in place in the database, and we have transformed to an actions in an immutable log, and then we can have another optimization on our con consumers to work in batch. So um, 
Let's talk about what is happening in the real world. So as I mentioned before, uh, companies like Twitter, companies like Facebook, and even enterprise companies need to hold uh, hun millions of concurrent users, and it even can achieve 200 of millions of concurrent users. So for that, I am suggesting another small improvement in our architecture in order to be able to hold that kind of scale. So, uh, what I would like to talk to you about, and as you can see, the blue square is now um, uh, located down this diagram, is using a technology which called Event Stream. So, Event Stream is a big data technology, and it is about uh, processing events on uh, continuous data stream, the streams, and um, you, you are able to do a lot of queries on this data stream in uh, zero time, so that is also nice technology that you, you really, um, it's good to get familiar with. So events, event stream would give you the extra mile in order to do the scaling, and what I'm saying that, you know, it's a stream. It's not something which is persistent. So you always have, have one consumer. Uh, you always have one consumer which just dumps all the events into a big warehouse, for example, just to store them, to do a lot of analytics uh, processing on them. So that is event stream. Um, technologies that are uh, really, that I need to mention here is Apache Kafka, which is a very popular technology for event streaming. And there, there is a library called Kafka Node, an NPM library which have a lot of downloads and a lot of usage, and Apache Kinesis. The last thing that I would like to say is about implementing transactions. So I want to give you a heads up. Most of the databases that you are familiar with use event log and use event sourcing in order to implement transactions. Um, so, um, but I use event sourcing in order to solve a problem in a banking system. I wrote a transaction engine to a banking system where all of the activities uh, were modeled as um, a records in the log. So a withdrawal, a deposit, everything alone was modeled as a record in the log. Um, and when I had to do a validation, for example, um, if I was able to perform that deposit, I checked uh, with my event log. The architecture here was extremely sophisticated, but uh, that was the heart of it. And it, uh, it, was, uh, it was used to uh, massive scales in production. So that is me. Thank you very much for listening. You can find me on Twitter. And um, the slides and the demo would be available there very, very soon. So thank you very much.